Good afternoon. My name is Yasmin Lima. I'm Vice President of the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition. I know this is a very uh, busy schedule that people have here, so thank you very much for taking the time to sure, talk to us. Sure, my pleasure. I'm with Dr. Bob Silicano, who is Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So you gave a wonderful presentation this morning on a very important subject, which is HIV persistence in patients on heart. Yes. I wonder whether we could start by you describing a little bit about the process of eradication and just why it's important to us. Well, um, since um, about 11 years ago when highly active antiretroviral therapy first uh, was introduced, uh, there has been the hope that this form of treatment uh, could cure patients. And initially, actually, it was predicted that uh, two to three years of treatment would be sufficient uh, to achieve a cure. And then there was a great deal of disappointment when it was discovered that uh, there were reservoirs of HIV that uh, uh, persisted even in patients on heart. And since that time, um, there's really been a lot of pessimism about the possibility of a cure. In fact, people don't even talk about it very much. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, now there's, uh, as a result of certain research developments, increased interest in you know, what exactly are the steps we need to take in order to find a cure. And of course, there's many, many laboratories working on this, and I think we now have a better idea of what, what it's really going to take. We don't know how long it will take, but I think we know the steps uh, that are going to be necessary to, to find a cure. And what would you say were the, the main barriers to this field? Is, are they scientific? Are we asking the right questions? Do we have the right technologies to be doing that? Um, yes, I think we have. I think we're asking the right questions. Uh, the technologies, um, uh, in some cases, are very good. In other cases, we need to develop. Um, the what, what's happened is that we, we've sort of broken the process down into steps. And the first, in my opinion, the first step is to stop the virus from replicating. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that goal, I believe, has already been achieved uh, with the even with current heart medications, although this is a very controversial issue. Um, I believe current research suggests that um, we can stop the virus from replicating. Now we have to find all of the forms of it that are not replicating, but just persisting. Uh, we know some of them, but we may not know all of them. And then we have to find a way to get rid of them, and that's really the toughest problem. Uh, nobody really knows what that's going to take or how hard that will be. So if the combination therapies help to suppress, you showed this morning that intensification doesn't necessarily have a great impact. Why might that be? Well, the reason that, that adding a fourth drug or intensification of, of heart doesn't help is that heart is actually already at its maximum potential. That is, uh, if you stopped all of the cycles of replication in a patient, then, there's, then you can't do any better than that. And I think some people find it surprising, but in fact, in a patient who has an undetectable viral load, uh, we believe that the virus is not replicated. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that is confusing is that uh, patients often have blips or uh, with very sensitive methods, you can find the free virus particles in the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, people have thought that means the virus is replicating, but our research shows that uh, that actually is not due to viral replication. That is due to the virus coming out of these reservoirs uh, at a low rate, and it's not going into any new cells. It's just being spit out of these reservoirs, um, and that process is going on um, in a patient on heart, but doesn't have any uh, consequence uh, for the patient. Adding a fourth drug doesn't stop that process and doesn't stop new infection of cells because that's already been stopped. And now this is in the optimal situation where a patient is taking the drugs correctly and has the right dose and the right pharmacokinetics and so forth, in the optimal situation. And I appreciate that this is an area of research, but in terms of kind of clinical relevance, you showed a very interesting slide with the different components of a heart regimen and their contribution. If I were a physician, should any of this have an impact on the regimens that I put together? Not yet, because this is a very um, a new research 
finding, and basically the finding is that there's a new way to measure how good antiretroviral drugs are that uh, I think um, shows that some of the drugs are way better than we thought. And this applies particularly to some of the protease inhibitors and the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. Um, but at this point, this is just a research uh, tool and a lot more work is necessary to tell whether, to tell how important this finding is in actually determining what is a good regimen. Okay, and you threw in something very interesting in, in your talk, which was the IIP, the Instantaneous Inhibitory Potential. Could you describe what that is and why that might be important to us? Yes, that is just a measure of how much you inhibit a single round of infection uh, when you use a, a particular drug at the right concentration. Uh, and it's a, a logarithmic scale, so it's the number of tenfold reductions in uh, the amount of infection. And the reason that this is new and important is that the previous way to look at this was sort of on a, a linear 1 to 100 scale uh, but the antiretroviral drugs are actually much better than that. They cause, uh, uh, in some cases, a million-fold inhibition, uh, or in the case of certain protease inhibitors, a billion-fold inhibition. Uh, so we have to look at it on a whole different uh, scale. Uh, and in, in fact, I think we've been underestimating how good some of the drugs that we have right now are. Mm -hmm. And that's what that index is trying to, uh, to help people understand. And I appreciate that your area of expertise is viral kinetics, but Dr. Bruce, Bruce Walker from Harvard focuses on similar issues, but from an immune perspective. It seems a fortuitous area for both of you to be working in. What are the implications of your work on his and the other way around? Well, Bruce is studying patients who control the virus uh, without drugs. The elite controllers. The elite controllers, and they achieve essentially the same level of control as patients on heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're doing it uh, uh, immunologically, uh, whereas uh, patients on heart, all of the work is being done uh, by the drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, parallel, um, and I think both fields of research can, can, can contribute uh, to the other one. Um, in our view, uh, what's happening in the elite controllers is that they actually have this uh, same phenomena where there's a little bit of virus in the blood. Mm -hmm. But in that case, uh, the virus is actually replicating. And it's being controlled by the immune response, but right. there's some evidence right. for evolution, right. that it's continuing to evolve, and, and yet the immune system is able to hold it in check. And it's very interesting that the immune system can do that. And right. if we understood that better, I mean, one goal would be to, if we can't cure everybody, to make them an elite controller. Absolutely. So that they, they are have no detectable or have very low levels of virus in the blood without drugs. Okay. Uh, we don't know how to do that yet. Uh, normally, the immune system, uh, of course, has an effect on the virus, but it's not nearly as strong as the effect achieved by these drugs except in these very unique patients. That's really interesting. I think in, with other chronic diseases, there are um, diseases in which our immune system kind of keeps a check. Yeah. And what we found with heart is that you have an, an effect with treatment, and then once you take the treatment off, then the viral replication comes back. That's right. You also showed that phylogenetic analysis, that the virus in the plasma, gen the analysis was similar to the profile right. in actually in the reservoirs. Yes. What does that mean? Well, uh, that that would be what you would expect if the virus in the plasma is just coming out of these reservoirs and not really continuing to replicate. It's just sort of a one-way. Is it's that a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing because it means that uh, uh, the virus is coming out of the reservoirs, but it's not able to infect any more cells. Okay. And it doesn't continue to change and evolve. That's why it just looks like what's in the reservoir. Okay. And if it can't, if it can't uh, uh, undergo genetic change, uh, you can't develop resistance. And in principle, you won't fail in treatment. Okay. So it is a good thing. Wonderful. And then you also talked about the remarkable work that's going on in your team in terms of both the technology and the scientific questions that you're asking. I wonder whether we could conclude with, with some of your comments on that. Well, I'm very fortunate to have a phenomenal group of young people, and I think one of the 
most important things that we need to do in the field is to recruit uh, smart young people to enter this field. Uh, clearly, this is a problem that's going to be with us for a long period of time uh, before we find a cure and a vaccine, and it's a problem that affects 33 million people now, increasing mm -hmm. all the time, and it's going to be here uh, probably for, for my lifetime, uh, and, and, and we need lots of new, uh, smart young people coming into the field, absolutely. Okay, and then I have to ask you, Dr. Silicano, do you think in your lifetime we will see the management of HIV without the use of drugs? Well, I'm 56. <laughs> um, uh, so I, 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 I hope so, yes, I, I certainly hope so. And what do you think yeah. is the next biggest challenge for us in terms of a breakthrough in this area of research? Uh, I think the biggest challenge is, is to find a way to get rid of these cells that have latent HIV. Right now, it's not really clear how we're going to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's for my taking pleasure. the time to talk yeah, to us. My